Welcome to the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women Hot Topic Session presented by Methodist Health System. Today joining us, we have Kim Hurst. Kim is a training consultant with Best Care Employee Assistance Program at Methodist. As a trainer with Best Care EAP, Kim can often be found working directly with organizations and individuals alike to foster leadership growth, workplace wellness, and team development. With interest in self-care, mental health awareness, and creating mental health-friendly workplaces, Kim is proud to be on a team that believes in meeting the needs of each client while making them feel valued throughout the process. Kim particularly enjoys helping organizations navigate difficult situations while enhancing employee happiness at work and at home. Her favorite moments in her career often come when someone tells her of the positive influences she's had on them. Welcome, Kim. Thank you so much, Kelsey. It's so great to be here with you all today. Thanks for joining us. Today, our conversation is the road to wellness, navigating mental health through change and uncertainty. I'm so glad you're all here for the 2021 Go Red for Women. So let's get started. Today, we're going to look at the following correlation between heart disease and mental health. Obviously, uh, with Go Red for Women, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can for our heart, heart health. And we know that there is a huge correlation when it comes to our mental health as well as our heart health. So we're going to look at our current environment and impact on women's mental health, as well as really defining mental health and really what the impact of change and the uncertainty of the last uh, couple of years has meant for all of us when it comes to our mental health. And then, of course, we're going to dive into some proactive habits that we can all utilize to keep our heart and our mind healthy. So when it comes to the connection between uh, heart disease and mental health, we know that there is uh, basically an effect from both sides. Uh, possible uh, physiological pathways include um, pain, fear, increased cardiac reactivity, uh, re reduced blood flow to the heart, and an increased cort cortisol when it comes to um, effects of mental health on our bodies. Now, on the flip side that we see um, really kind of behavioral pathways include um, medication or non-adherence to medication, smoking, or physical inactivity that come from dealing with a mental illness that could lead to stroke heart or heart attack or heart failure, cardiovascular disease. So we know that whether it be anxiety, depression, the chronic stress or post-traumatic stress disorder that people have been suffering this last 18 plus months has a huge impact for our long-term physical health. So of course, we all know that we've been on a huge journey these, these last months. And with, with, without just the impact of COVID-19, there's been, of course, that fear, the loss, and the grief that we've all suffered. But there's been so many different uh, domino effects from that, whether it be our physical isolation and the lack of support and togetherness that people are facing, or economic fallout. Obviously, the civil uh, unrest and social injustice that we're experiencing. And of course, again, that intense political divide. We've had so much conflict in our lives. And there's been a lot of mental health misconceptions in the recent years in terms of uh, stigma and stereotypes and really just a lot of barriers to people getting the right care that they need. And now uh, being it's fall, we're going into the winter months and that can have some seasonal health influences when it comes to seasonal affective disorder uh, in addition to other mental um, struggles that people are facing. And finally, uh, our evolving work environments, and I know this hits close to home for many of us when it comes to what those working environments look like. Are we going back to the office? Have we been on the front line the entire time? Or are we really kind of juggling that back and forth when it comes to constant changes? So we know there's been huge impact no matter what uh, the, the struggle has been for each of us individually. And we've seen a huge surge when it comes to the mental health concerns between uh, women and children versus um, men and boys. It's very disproportionate. And across 38 countries, the number of women reporting mental health impacts from COVID-19 has been three times greater than that of men. Uh, more than 25% of women have reported increased stress, anxiety, and other mental health struggles due to COVID-19. 
And of course, we know that labor uh, amount and the um, amount of time spent working has uh, drastically increased for women on the front line, as well as many industries. And what we're seeing right now are, are rapid burnout rates and a lot of uh, PTSD, compassion fatigue, and, and again, those, those mental health struggles definitely associated directly to the nature of our work. Uh, of course, family stress, again, that, that proportion um, is not uh, equal when it comes to the responsibilities that most women take on, including homeschooling or caring for others and, and those kinds of struggles. So that, again, the impact has been uh, enormous. I don't want to be all doom and gloom today. We know that there is a silver lining. Uh, luckily, the current climate that we're all experiencing has really shed uh, a huge bright light on mental health. And that uh, gives us more of a voice to break the stigma and stereotypes and really make sure that people know about the resources at hand. Uh, some of those resources include our virtual mental health resources, such as telehealth and phone counseling, and, and really all different ways that we can see our physicians and counselors um, at this point in time. Uh, people with mental illnesses, we know, can really live happy and productive lives if given the right tools and resources. So we just need to make sure that we're all doing our part to help, whether it be helping create our, our uh, mental health-friendly workplace cultures at work, but at home as well, uh, reducing those stigmas and stereotypes, but also pr promoting the treatment and awareness that's necessary to help reduce suicide and the uh, substance and alcohol usage, usage rates as well. So one of the things I wanted to really look at today is the definition of mental health. A lot of the things that I've mentioned already are uh, really just illnesses or disorders when it comes to mental health. I've mentioned uh, anxiety and depression and PTSD, but we don't want to think of mental health just as a negative. Uh, from the World Health Organization, who we've all come to know throughout the pandemic, they state that mental health is a state of well-being in which every individual realizes their own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to their own community. And so we look at this statement and know that, again, the goal is realizing that potential and having those, those coping resources and strategies so that we can be making productive uh, contributions and, and enjoying life, right? So mental health, I just like to remind us all that it's not a binary state. It's a continuum. It, we're not either um, mentally healthy all the time or mentally ill all the time. We're going to range from excellent mental health to severe symptoms of mental disorders. And there's a lot of different zones. We're not going to dive into each one in particular in great detail, just to the nature of our time today. But we want to just take a quick glimpse at what these look like. When it comes to excelling, of course, a cheerful, joyful attitude, an energetic, um, high energy, again, when it comes to um, our personal and professional lives, seeing great performance at work, and really realizing our own potential. Now, in that middle um, spectrum surviving, we see more worried behaviors, uh, nervous and irritable, uh, distracted and withdrawn. That lack of focus has been really real uh, these last 18 months. And then in crisis, very low mood, highly anxious. We're seeing people not coming to work, um, highly exhausted and um, not eating or sleeping well or having any or normal social activity at all. So the, the spectrum is very broad, but we want to keep an eye on some of these symptoms so that we know what to look for. So as we're talking about mental health and the impact of the last uh, uh, couple of years that we've had on us, we know it's a lot about change and change is rarely easy. Uh, I, I threw a definition in here uh, to undergo transformation, transition or substitution, but I actually like this one a little bit better. Uh, it's a never ending process of readjustment and readaptation as we respond behaviorally, behaviorally to uh, ever changing circumstances. And I don't know if any of you felt like this little goldfish with the shark fin on lately, really trying to adapt and, and readjust constantly over these last months as things have really been uh, a very rocky and unstable environment for us all. But something that I wanted to point out when it comes to change, 
it's very easy to talk about change from an external standpoint, but people transition. So when we talk about things changing, our circumstances and events driving these things, it can be very rapid and impersonal. But when it comes to us as individuals, as humans, and as people, these changes have to transition very much internally. And these involve our our thoughts and our emotions. And again, are highly personal to each of us. This takes time. It's not going to adjust at the same uh, pace as, as the way things are evolving around us. So we have to remind ourselves of the process and the amount of time that these things can truly take to transition in response to these uh, evolving circumstances. So as we, we really kind of switch gears now to what we can all do through these changes, reminding ourselves that it is truly a process, what we can all do to be proactive to really navigate this change and uncertainty. Uh, we're going to talk about a few things here, our mindfulness and self-awareness, um, self-compassion, emotional support, and really setting boundaries and assessing our priorities. So mindfulness. I love this little visual. We've got this little uh, person walking their dog in a park and their mind is just jam full of what is going on in their lives. All of the things around us, the constant chaos, the carpool, the kids, the family, the work, all of those things. And so we call that mind full. Uh, Now you see the dog on the other hand, he's enjoying the park. He's seeing his surrounding. He's uh, visualizing the trees and feeling the, the heat of the sun and enjoying the time with his owner in the park. That's truly being in the moment and being mindful. So when we're thinking about our ever evolving circumstances, no matter where we are and, and what we're going into in this next phase of, of our environment, where are we? Where is our mind? We need to bring ourselves back to the present and become more mindful so that we can really start assessing what we need to do. And that really takes a lot of emotional intelligence. And the first piece of emotional intelligence is self-awareness. And I know this sounds kind of corny, but naming it to tame it can help so much when it comes to what feeling are we feeling. Uh, So when it comes to this little visual here, it's a, it's an emotion wheel. You've probably seen this before, but it helps us really greater define and become more specific of what we're truly feeling. Notice it and name it specifically, not just sadness, but is it uh, depression or um, isolation or burnout? And then use these to to move to the next steps on uh, focusing on what we can control and then doing some emotional self-regulation. Now, that sounds very clinical, but now that I'm aware of my emotions, now what? Um, Really, how can we influence what we're experiencing and how we're experiencing our emotions, Um, whether it be a, a controlled conscious response or an unconscious response? And so... One of the great ways that we can regulate our emotions is that cognitive reappraisal. We really need to alter the way we think. When we're experiencing a feeling of distress, of, of uh, again, um, with, due to change or uncertainty or really burnout, ask yourself, is this consistent feeling during these instances and situations? And then ask yourself, do I have control over the situation? First of all, if I don't have control, I need to step back and re shift my perspective to what I truly can and do control myself. Uh, Now, the next thing is really kind of my thought replacement, uh, changing those negatives to positives and truly role reversal. If, If you were to be talking to a friend and they were telling you about the situation you're in, what would you say to them at this moment? Help yourself look through a new lens and look for the positives. Uh, Again, I know people give optimism a bad rap. It's not all about uh, rainbows and butterflies, but really about focusing on uh, the the positives in others, the positives in the situation, and the positives in ourselves when it comes to the circumstances we find ourselves in. So this, again, is a huge reminder for me about the optimism. I love this quote. Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right, right? So our key to optimism is is really what we're telling ourselves. What's that internal voice? 
and, and even our external voice when we're talking to ourselves about what we're thinking. Um, I love this little visual too. Captain Optimism says, I will defeat you. Pessimistic man says, yeah, probably. Because that's the nature of the beast, right? That's how it goes. And we need to really focus on our mindset. Of course, self-compassion is really important. What are we going to do for ourselves? I know you're probably hearing all about self-care the last couple of years, but uh, really what works for you? Is it deep breathing exercises or relaxation techniques, including meditation or yoga? Um, journaling about uh, the positive, some gratitude journaling. As far as positive affirmations go, what do I need to remind myself? Uh, what do I need to stop telling myself when it comes to those positives and negatives? We're a pretty uh, negative and harsh on ourselves. We're kind of our, our worst critics. So what can we do? And then start saying out loud to ourselves when it comes to a mantra per se. And then, of course, uh, really reevaluating our priorities. I know a lot of people have really shifted that throughout the pandemic about what has really become most important to us in life. But we also need to set some personal and professional boundaries. Um, boundaries are really important because a lot of us, especially uh, women, tend to always be helping and nurturing and taking care of others. We, we can't overextend ourselves. It is okay to say no to demands on our time for our own health. Uh, we also need to speak up if, if certain core, bound, uh, core value boundaries are violated when it comes to maybe being disrespected or somebody doing something that really goes against our values. Um, have those conversations. Most time people don't realize what they're doing or the impact that they're having. And obviously not having the intention to have a negative impact. Uh, but what do those boundaries look like when it comes to our working hours? Um, establish true schedule, especially if you've shifted to working at home, because we know that many people are adjusting their schedules to uh, really work way more often than they're used to. And of course, find some activities that have nothing to do with the areas that are causing our stress. And lastly, emotional support is so important. What can we all do to enlist the help of others? Reach out to those people that we're closest to. And of course, limit contact with those that are negative. We know that they can real, really be a drain on our energy. Um, connecting with community groups or volunteering for a cause that's meaningful to you is so helpful. Uh, but building new friendships and being more sociable, whether it be with family members or friends and coworkers, there's way we can still do that and keep our physical distance um, when it comes to our safety. Talk to our managers when it comes to their expectations and what you might need, especially when it comes to some of those work boundaries and things that you might need to have a little bit of flexibility about. And then last but not least, utilizing your employee assistance program. Of course, I'm very passionate about EAPs because I'm part of one, but I've had the relationship with one for my entire career, and I've really utilized it, not just for myself, but for my own family members and reminding those that I work with when I know that they're struggling with something difficult as well. So I just want to thank you guys on behalf of myself and Methodist Health System and Best Care EAP today. I want you to all go out there and make a change today. One baby step that you can put into practice after today not just to take care of yourself, but to take care of each other. We're all in this together. So thank you so much for your time. Kelsey, thank you so much for having me today. Kim, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, just you talked about defining mental health, noticing what we're feeling and naming it, focusing on what we can control and just altering the way we think and are reevaluating our priorities. The quote that really stuck with me was, I'm in charge of how I feel today and I'm choosing happiness. I love that. So thank you so much for helping us look at this topic through a new lens. Thanks, Kelsey.